Welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast by Third Wave, connecting you to the leaders and pioneers of the psychedelic renaissance. This is Joseph Anu, and today I am speaking with plant medicine facilitator and integration coach, Adrian Lozano. When I first started working with plant medicine, it was not easy for me, but I think it was really to go deep with, within my own healing process, to learn how to work with the sacred medicine, to learn how they're teachers, how they can show us things, and how to build a relationship with them. So now I do have a strong connection with them. And when I speak to others, when I help guide them through this process, I can speak with confidence because I have been there. You, you can only take someone as far as you've gone with yourself. So when someone is going through that themselves, I can sit with them in the darkness as well because I've been through that in my own journey. Hey listeners, this is Joseph Anu, Institute Director at the Psychedelic Coaching Institute. It's been a while since I've sat down with you here as co-host on the Psychedelic Podcast, and I'm excited for today's exploration. We're going to be diving into the very essence of psychedelic integration with my guest, Adrian Lozano. Adrian is a plant medicine facilitator and integration coach with over seven years of experience. His own healing journey was catalyzed by the power of plant medicines. Now, Adrian holds space for others to realize the same healing potential through education, guidance, and support around the safe and intentional use of plant medicine. Adrian leads retreats, facilitates ceremonies, and supports individuals with microdosing and integration. In our conversation today, Adrian shares his journey with psychedelics, which helped him tap into his inner strengths and unique gifts to go from living with anxiety and depression to living on purpose with an open heart. He emphasizes the importance of regulating the nervous system and overcoming social anxiety. Adrian also highlights the role of integration and self-regulation in the psychedelic experience. Together, Adrian and I explore the benefits of microdosing and breathwork as tools for personal growth and transformation, and we get into building trust with psychedelic medicines, what that means, and why it is so important. Adrian shares how the coaching certification program transformed his professional trajectory. He offers his perspective on the ever-evolving psychedelic field, highlighting the importance of ethics and community. Adrian also introduces his group microdosing program, touching on the power of community in psychedelic integration. And a quick note, if you want to learn more about our certification program at the intersection of psychedelic medicine, high-performance coaching, and the frontiers of human potential, head on over to psychedeliccoaching.institute. All right, that's it for now. I hope you enjoy my conversation today with Adrian Lozano. Adrian, brother, great to see you again here. Uh, take two on this podcast. How are you, brother? Doing pretty good. Thanks for having me on again. <laughs> of course, of course. For those listening, we this is our second attempt. We had some technical difficulties the other day, and uh, we decided to live and fight another day. So here we are, and we're going to dive in, pick up where we left off. So, Adrian, um, I'd love to just kind of start where we where we where we do here in terms of your lived experience and and sort of how you found yourself working with psychedelics professionally. Where, where did your journey begin with these medicines? Yeah, so my journey began about seven years ago. And it was when I graduated college, I had, you know, just left the world, moved to Los Angeles. And I found myself in a dark place. I was um, dealing with depression, anxiety, panic attacks. So my, my, my body started like screaming at me saying like something is not right. And that's what kind of called me to have curiosity around psychedelics. So I've, I've heard that they were transformative and healing. And for me, I was like, okay, this cannot be the way of living my life of not being, not being in the place that I, I want to be with, with myself. So I got curious and I went to a uh, ceremony and that's kind of where the, my world kind of flipped. And I, I really saw how these medicines have given us an opportunity to look deeper within ourselves to look at ourselves at parts that we might not want to see otherwise. And it, it's been kind of a, a journey since then, but really has changed how I, I live my life, how I feel about myself, the self-love that I have. And most importantly, I think uh, living from my heart instead of being in my mind. Mm. I love that. So, you know, you were anxious and depressed. You took some mushrooms and it cured everything. And now you're perfect, right? No, no. I wish it was, it was actually ayahuasca. Was the first thing I went to. 
Yeah, oh, I, wow. I dove straight to the deep end with that. Yeah. And <clears throat> it wasn't like after that for me, it my it wasn't as simple as like it took it went, went to ceremony, was healed. Um it actually took a while for me to actually integrate and learn how to um do the work that the medicine was teaching me. And at first my depression ended up getting worse because I didn't have support, I didn't have community, I didn't have structure on what to do after the ceremony. And that's when I realized how important that is and kind of why I, I do the work that I do today. Yeah, man. I love that, Adrian. And what was so interesting because we've spoke before is um, your life, you know, you explained to me that, you know, it was really when your college career ended that this sort of um, depression, anxiety, uh, this sort of transformational energy, well, that's what you did with it. You know, for other people, it might have, you know, brought them down, but you, you know, chose to, chose to really seek support and, and, uh, a, th- a therapy and a modality that would work for you. But, you know, it really raises an interesting question or, or insight for me. And that's, you know, in this modern world, you know, we've, we've heard the term like we're, we're human doings and, and not human beings. And, mm-hmm. um, it's interesting how in many ways, you know, especially with, you know, we're talking about education, but you know, social media or Twitter, or, you know, whatever it is, there's so many ways to keep busy and, and keep distracted. And, you know, from what I took from, from what you shared with me a week or so ago, you know, in many ways, I felt like, wow, education, it's this big lily pad that we're on and it feels so secure and so stable. But, you know, after four years, we got to jump off that lily pad. And, and then it's sort of like, who am I? What am I doing here? What, what am I here to create? What, where do I, what do I do for a job? Like things get real, real quick. And that's when it sounded to me, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that's where like you started to come through and there was this anxiety and this sort of, um, you know, it was kind of in many ways created by the end of college. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, and by the end of college, I had my my first job out of college, and I saw the path that was laid out for me. And also, I think what what really helped me see that I didn't really want that was seeing others in my path that had been there longer, and really like counting down the days till their retirement, or really not happy with their with their with their jobs and lives and what they were doing. And I was able to see how I wanted to do more than that. I, I wanted to make impact in the world. I wanted to have a purpose and really um, serve to others, but not in the way that I was doing it or that I was taught conventionally through college, which to me was kind of mind-blowing. I almost wanted to go back and redo it again, but I was like, yeah, I'm not getting into depth to do that again. So it really was like seeing the the path that was laid by society for me and not being happy with what that would look like for myself. Yeah, you know, and I th- I'm sure, you know, there's some younger, you know, people in this audience and it's... uh yeah, you know, you graduate college and you're like, I don't know what you study, but it's like maybe fixing people's computers isn't the way I'm going to feel maximally fulfilled. Maybe it's not the thing that's going to really feel like I, you know, put my stamp on the world. And so isn't it interesting, though, how some of those wake up calls and those moments uh, lead us into a higher calling and uh, lead us to where we were supposed to be all along, perhaps. And I think for, and yeah, and I think for me, it was realizing that through my work with psychedelics, I was able to learn that I, I do have gifts. I do have um, gifts that were given to me that I didn't know through school. I wasn't able to tap into. I think that like psychedelics allow us to tap into our, our true inner strengths or inner powers that can we can really be creative with who we are as human beings, not as what society wants us to be or who our parents want us to be. So I think that for me was the biggest thing was realizing that once I started working with the medicine and it, it helped me really learn who I was, learn what my gifts are, learn what I feel most interested in. That's when I got to, okay, this is, I'm onto something. And I really wanted to dive deeper into that, into that, to that um, inner knowing for myself. What were the, what were the hidden gifts? Like, if you don't mind sharing, like what was the sort of person that was hiding behind all that programming that you sort of were able to, to let out of the cage, so to speak. Yeah, I think my, my, my biggest gift is living, having a big open heart and, and living from my heart. And I think I didn't know to do that. I was taught not to do that, not to tap into my emotions, not to tap into my, my inner um, landscape with myself. So it was really bringing people together, being able to live from my heart and teach others how to do that as well. What's new uh, since you sort of pulled yourself maybe out of the mind and into the heart a little bit, how has that impacted your daily life? I think for me, the biggest thing is being able to be present, 
And for me, that was not something that I knew how to do. I lived very in my mind. I felt like I was a prisoner of my own mind. Like I had really bad social anxiety before. And I really, it, it kind of numbed me in a way where I wasn't able to fully be in the world because I was so caught up in my mind. I would, and that's where my anxiety started kicking in. I would have panic attacks when I would be in certain social uh, situations. So for me to live in my heart meant to be more present, to be in the here and now, to be present with the people that are in front of me and and live live more in the being instead of doing. And I think that a lot of people of my generation, because of technology, because of social media, because of just everything out there, all the information that we have, we're always consuming, always doing, and never really live in the heart space. So that has been the biggest thing that has has changed for me was being more present, doing things that bring me more joy. And instead of just being like, a robot, how, 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 how I felt before. Mm. Yeah, no. And I think, you know, I think as you said, you know, you're, um, this generation, you know, I, I feel I was somewhat fortunate, you know, I didn't have a cell phone till I was like almost done with college. I, you know, Facebook wasn't a thing till I was, you know, almost done with college. And, you know, I was kind of like the last, the last generation of like, um, old school, like we had to carry books and stuff. And I think that social anxiety and, and an inability to connect with an actual person is is not only a main, major problem now, but it's only in the COVID era, right? Like my kids, my three-year-old went like two and a half years before he ever saw a person that wasn't my wife or I, you know? So like, what is this what did that look like, you know, for someone that may be listening that that has some social anxiety, particularly if they're, you know, between the ages of like, you know, 18 and 30? Um, you know, what does that look like? Psychedelics aside, if you were going to do it without psychedelics, like what what advice would you give somebody that does struggle with the face to face that does struggle with the social anxiety and and getting out into the world and um, that may be hiding behind a screen as much as possible these days? Yeah, I think for me, the biggest thing that helped me out was to realize that my mind was telling me all sorts of narratives, all sorts of things that weren't really true. And I didn't really know not to listen to that. So it kind of crippled me in a way where it it, it, it might have been due to past traumas that I had from my childhood. But I really, I, I didn't know how else to live. So really, my my nervous system was not regulated. So I was really, I was living in a place of fear, living in a place of of, of, of freeze that didn't allow me to just be. So I think learning how to regulate my nervous system, learning how to breathe, learning somatic work and learning like where my anxiety is, how it shows up, where it's coming from, what stories is it telling me? I think that was the biggest thing was learning to build a relationship with my anxiety in a way that I was able to turn to it and learn that, hey, maybe this is telling me something and maybe I don't have to listen to it. So once I started, started slowly started to regulate my nervous system and then also have courage, have courage to show up, have courage to put myself in these situations where I was in in the room and I was speaking, I was talking to people always out, out of my comfort zone. I, I learned that for me, I was not growing within my comfort zone. And it's really hard when you have social anxiety and you do want to step outside of it. When it's really hard when you, when you want to be a leader, when you want to talk in front of others, but you're so crippled by this part of you that doesn't allow you to move past that. So I think for me was learning how to work with it, and also just being courageous, stepping into it, and then seeing like, oh, wow, once I started doing this, like people weren't throwing eggs at me or laughing at me or all the things that my, my mind was telling me would happen. And then slowly I started to realize that, okay, you know what, this is not as scary as it seems. And I, I think that that's when things started changing for me. I started living with freedom instead of being held back from my own self. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a positive reinforcement thing. You step out of that comfort zone. And I think anytime we step out of our comfort zone, it's, it's often very rewarding. You know, it's people, people remember the one time they went whitewater rafting 25 years ago, but they, you know, they, they've deleted so much of the other stuff, right? There's this, there's this call to step out of that comfort zone. And the unfortunate thing is on the flip side is if we never do that, our comfort zone tends to get smaller and smaller um, and more and more things give us anxiety if we don't take that step and have that courage. Uh, one of my um, uh, actually past facilitators and um, he's a, he's an MD. He says, fear, false evidence appearing real. Mm -hmm. I love that. 
And I think that, you know, that courage is something that sort of entering that positive feedback loop um, is something that maybe psychedelics have, would you say, kind of greased the groove a little bit for you, made it easier than it would have been if you hadn't sort of explored that part of yourself? Definitely. I, mean, I, I think when I first started working with psychedelics, um, they would often be difficult experiences because at the time my anxiety was so bad that I would have like panic attacks in ceremony. And and really for me, it was learning to step into that, learning how to surrender. And then I was able to see all the different stories in my mind. It would be like a hundred miles per hour, but I was really learning. And the biggest thing was learning how to breathe. That's the most, for me, the most powerful tool in a psychedelic experience is the breath, the body coming back. So for me, it was like being in a really uncomfortable place, learning how to work through that, how to navigate the fear, how to surrender to it, and then seeing on the other side, like, oh, wow, like it actually wasn't that bad. And I became stronger. Things didn't become easier. I just became stronger throughout my, throughout my journey and seeing how, you know, psychedelics really put that in the forefront. I think that's what the medicine wanted me to work on and really work through and that's what it kind of empowered me to 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 become stronger and to become more resilient. I love that. Things didn't get easier. I just got stronger. That's like that sounds like a Chuck Norris joke. You remember those? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I love that. And, and of course, you know, you're a graduate of, of one of the first cohorts of our certification program, which is uh, a program I was in the third cohort. I think, were you in the first cohort? Yeah, I was in the first one. So, you know, it's such a big deal to Paul is this self-regulation. You know, it's one of our five pillars that we that we teach and this, you know, finding whether it's the breath or just becoming aware and and that self-regulation. You know, it sounds like, you know, you mentioned you jumped into the deep end first. And I, and I, I do want to ask you a question on that. But um, as it relates to self-regulation, like what is what is what is that? You've you've said it a little bit, but like. In a social situation, I guess, if there's anything more we can dive into there, what, is that, what does that mean to you? To me, when I think about that, it's almost like I think of the word self-soothing. Like, what are, if, if my nervous system does become regulated, what can I do to help bring it down? So for me, it's breathing, moving somatically, or even telling myself positive reinforcements that can get me out of that mind loop. So it's really tending to myself, letting myself know, hey, you're not in danger you're safe, you're strong, you're amazing. All of these things that I was never told when I was young. And I tell myself that. And I also, I, I breathe. I check in with my body. I notice where, where, it's, where it's at, how it's showing up. What does it feel like? And I really allow myself to move through that in a way that before I didn't know how to do. And I think before I, I would numb myself and I would disassociate and become outside of my body. So that became a whole thing too. So being able to self-soothe myself in situations where I thought it was a fight or flight mode. That's what kind of has, has helped me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the piece, right? Is this, um, this, this feeling into the body, you know, I think when people have anxiety, they're so, it's so between the ears behind the eyes that they don't say like, what are my feet feeling like? What, what does my body feel like? What, where is my breath going? What is, you know, that sort of, you know, tuning in, I think is, is just so important. And I think that's where a lot of people, you know, even, even outside the psychedelic space could, could really benefit from. But I think as you get into this work, whether it's before or after, I think stepping into that um, is just such a powerful tool and it doesn't just help with anxiety. It's about um, just about everything really it connects us with our intuition ultimately, which is sort of, you know, the most powerful force we probably have. Yeah, definitely. I agree. And I think that's also, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because once I was able to regulate and not be so anxious, I was able to tap into my intuition. And that was like my North Star. And that's where I was really able to become the person that I am today. I strongly feel that. And and I mentioned I wanted to come back to you, you know, starting at the top of the food chain there with the um, with ayahuasca. As a coach in this space, you know, you you host retreats, you do integration coaching, um, if you were coaching you, Adrian, like what, where would you have started with ayahuasca? How would you treat yourself as a client if you walked in your own door? Yeah. And I definitely will not start with ayahuasca. That to me was really diving that deep end. And, uh, I, I did, it was sink or swim. I almost sank for a bit. 
So I would now, as a coach, really start people off slowly and I with microdosing, breath work, meditation, um, practices that are going to help someone really ease into it and, and kind of have the tools to support them if they if they were to go on a deeper journey. I think for me, um, and I, I had done no work prior to my ayahuasca experience. I didn't know anything about meditation, breath work, or any kind of tools to help me. So when I got into the experience, it, it shook my core and it, it kind of really disrupted everything to where I didn't have the tools to regulate. I didn't have the tools to help me move through that, to integrate that. So life became a little bit more confusing for me afterwards. Yeah. And I think this is, you know, we should definitely, you know, kind of expand on this, you know, my, just a quick note on my personal story is, you know, I've been doing health, wellness, fitness for 20 years, uh, immediately prior to stepping into psychedelic work, I had already been teaching breath work for seven or eight years. I'd been doing cold plunges for about that time. We had done three real serious years of Kundalini yoga, living in LA, working with a guy, a teacher. Um, and when I, when I first made the decision after a sober life in my thirties to, to step into this, I immediately, you know, on the back end was like, I can't imagine trying to integrate this without those 20 years, without having this relationship with yoga, this relationship with cold, this relationship with fitness, this relationship with running and breath and, and all of these things. So when you, when you'd say, you know, you, you, you know, you stepped into ayahuasca first, immediately my mind goes, holy smokes, you know, maybe more power to you, but Godspeed. But I am curious, you know, what that, and I know you said you wouldn't do it again, but you know, what did that look like on the back end? And I guess one more piece of context here is, you know, part of what I kind of really want to see from the psychedelic space. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm here with the Psychedelic Coaching Institute now and supporting this mission is because I do want people to find proper guidance and ethical guidance and, and have a lot of intention, which is just so in line with, with Paul's mission, of course, is, you know, that's why I'm here. It's because, uh, I do see the power of these medicines, but I also see the the the, the increasing prevalence of people um, stepping in the deep end and and struggling to integrate. When you know, oftentimes integration really is about stepping into the right ceremony. You know, you could be Sigmund Freud and not be able to integrate someone that just you know sat up off the couch and jumped into an ayahuasca ceremony. So, uh, what did that Adrian aftermath look like? um, for you and, and, and specifically, you know, how did you like pull yourself up, which I imagine you needed to do, um, following that like total blast off? Yeah. So it actually, for me, it was a process of two years of really learning how to work with the medicine and to learn how to swim essentially. So when I first went to my first ceremony, I came with, uh, I went with a group that flew in from Colombia. And they, I did two ceremonies with them. And then for me, I, because I didn't know what integration was, I didn't know about intention or any, any of that. After the ceremony, every, the, like I was really having the afterglow where I felt amazing. I felt great. I felt like everything was, was good and I was healed and all my problems went away. But once the afterglow, afterglow started to wear off, that's when the weeds started to grow back. That's when I started realizing like, oh, like the, my shit still here. Like ceremony does can only show you the way, can only help you see things that you might not be able to see before. But because I wasn't integrating, um, my depression actually got worse. And I I, I started going back to ceremony, help like trying to help myself heal and thinking that me doing the work was going to ceremony. So I think I went to like three more and the same thing would happen. I would go to ceremony. I would think I was healed spiritually bypass a lot of the actual work that I needed to do and and then find myself in a darker place. So it, it was after, I think I, for what I attribute to my life being my rock bottom, where I felt like I had nowhere else to go that I was like, okay, this is going to be my last shot in ceremony. And I had what I call to myself, like an ego dissolution, ego death experience where I, I felt like I was going to die. And I, I really became really scared and frightened. And it, I was being really stubborn and I didn't want to let go. And once I finally did let go, the medicine told me, okay, you need to do the work. You need to integrate. You've been here before. We've told you what to do. You're not doing it. I don't want you in ceremony anymore. 
and un- until you do show up for yourself. So for me, after that experience, that meant, okay, finally going to yoga. That was the biggest thing for me, learning, learning how to practice, move my body, learn how to breathe. Then I started going to therapy. Then I started working with a coach. And little by little, all of these little things started happening where I was finally able to see shifts happening, starting to able to see where my trauma came from, learn how to move with my body, learn how to move my breath, and really anchor myself into my own essence, to my own being. And for me, that's when my healing journey began was two years after my first ceremony, where if I probably would have done that before differently, I, I would have had more success, quote unquote, a little bit earlier and not suffered as much. But I think for me, it was important to go through that because that was what really taught me how to work with the medicines, how and how integration is so important and really how to hold space for others. You know, I'm thinking back, I interviewed uh, a couple of times, Dr. Stuart McGill, who's like probably the world's foremost back expert, like, you know, some stud athlete hurts, hurts their back. They're probably going to go see Stuart McGill. He's like, you know, he's, um, he's written the book on the low back and, um, you know, he said that, uh, a, a huge amount of low back surgeries are, are unnecessary. And, uh, what he recommends instead are what he calls virtual surgeries. And what it is, is you take somebody that has back pain and it's, you know, it's October 10th right now. And you've got surgery on November 6th and beginning November 6th, you're going to take all these days off work. You're going to go to physical therapy. You're going to do breath work. You're going to take walks in nature. You're going to reduce your stress. You're going to eat clean. But the surgery is pretend. It's just a date on the calendar. But what he does is he has people do all the things that they would have done if the surgery was in fact real. And it sounds like, you know, while, while medicines can provide this massive awakening and this massive shakeup and, and really get us, um, clear our fields and really connect us with our purpose. So it's like the psychedelic powers are incredible. But what's interesting is after you kind of went back to the well and weren't doing the work, it's like you finally got that message. But isn't it so interesting that you went into all the things that that somebody would do if they were opposed to psychedelics, right? So I love this sort of picture that psychedelics are this incredibly powerful tool, but they are that. They're a tool that does need these other pieces of the puzzle. And it's not just the ceremony. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't know that. And people think that going to a ceremony, they're going to change who they are, change their life and all of that. And while that, that could be true, it's what we do outside of ceremony. That's where the work is. That's where the, the ceremony really begins is once we step outside of that space, what are we going to do to integrate? How are we going to weave in whatever the medicine showed us in a way that is going to change us day in and day out? Because the the afterglow is going to wear off. And then, the like I said, the weeds can start to grow unless we're tending to that and having practices, tools that can support us on our normal day to day. Because it's not it's not really like we can go to ceremony every single time. And that's not it's not I, I don't think it's meant for that purpose. It's meant to teach us, to show us. And then it's up to us to do the work. So, so Adrian, and you mentioned microdosing and I, and I, that was, you know, personally, you know, where I began this, uh, this work myself. And so, you know, how do you, what is, what is microdosing? What does that mean to you? What does that do for you? What, how does that support your clients? Um, and, and what, which medicines do you prefer, um, in terms of microdosing? Yeah. And I'll also say that I didn't know much about microdosing before CCP, CCP one, like that's kind of a, a big part of what I do now. So I'm grateful that Paul is really spearheading um, microdosing and just being an advocate of the the, the power of, of working in, with uh, the medicine in a, in a small, gradual way. So for me, microdosing has been uh, a safe, a gentle way to for people to work with the medicine in a way that is kind of like learning how to build a relationship, learning how to work with it. And I work with psilocybin and LSD, mostly psilocybin. So I, I've had many clients that have no intention of being in ceremony or are, are afraid of psychedelics. Also, um, some clients that are older that might have a uh, experience with psychedelics that weren't so in the context that we're using it now. Right, so right, with, right. with folks with microdosing, I tell them like, look, 
you can do this in your normal day to day. This is meant is it, it's a tool to help you become more present, to become more aware, more conscious, and really build a connection. It can also be a good bridge to the ceremony, to and from. It can help with integration. So folks really like that. How it's safe, it's gentle, it's not so disrupting your normal day to day. And I've seen you know some of my clients that depending on where they're at, but they can see almost instantly of working with um, microdosing, how they're able to be less anxious, be less depressed, tap into their creativity, tap into flow states. And it's really profound how microdosing can really have that shift on people. And I, I think, you know, that's, that's where we're, we're, that's the, the psychedelic movement is kind of moving towards because it's more accessible. People can do it anywhere. They could, they, they don't have to go to ceremony or they don't have to, you know, do a special, you know, dieta or fly out or anywhere. They, they can do it from their home right now. Yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, what's so great about it too, in the world of extremes, right? Like these, these substances, you know, obviously set and setting, right? And so mm-hmm. where, where these substances have been demonized and, and, you know, largely illicit for the last several decades, there's a huge unclear relationship right so in other words like if somebody is 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 believes these things are bad and they're illegal and there's so much programming around that like stepping into a ceremony is a is a very big jump but creating an avenue where people can in an extremely controlled you know even sub perceptible means begin to you know taste what it's like to be in this and feel that chemistry you know, going to work in our own minds. It's, it's, it seems like an, an incredible gift and maybe in many ways the path forward, you know, for people to, um, to begin to kind of show people the forest through the trees in these once banned substances and, and still banned largely, right? Yeah. It's a safer experimentation process when the dose is tiny. Yeah. And, and I think people also, the biggest thing that it, it builds trust, it builds the relationship with the medicine. So they're able to see as as they're becoming more present, as they're becoming more connected to themselves, to their intuition, they're learning that, hey, this is something that's helping me. And this is something that can help me be whatever my in- intentions are to help me move towards that. So I think when people do microdose and they may or may not want to go to ceremony, but after the folks that microdose before ceremony that have no experience with psychedelics feel a lot more grounded, feel a lot more supportive. They've already done some work beforehand. They're regulating their nervous system. They're tapping into their intuition, being more present so that when they do decide to go to ceremony, they they feel a lot more equipped. Mm. They already have a relationship with the medicine, right? And so it's not this left field thing. It's this, um, it's this thing that they've, they've experienced and, and benefit from already. So it makes total sense that they would just be able to surrender. You mentioned surrendering. They'd be able to surrender and sort of sink into the experience so much more as opposed to like, you know, kind of having one eye open the whole time. Yeah. So that's why I say like for me, uh, you know, now knowing about microdosing and doing all this work, it kind of said, like, I mean, I didn't know any better back then. So going to an ayahuasca ceremony, that was like, oh man, like I, I, I would not do it that way, but hey, that's what kind of helped me be where I'm at today. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, hey, you, you you jumped off the cliff and you made it. So, you know. <laughs> um so so Adrian, I, I would love to kind of explore as well, you know, being in one in the first cohort of the certification program, I would love to hear about uh you you mentioned a second ago just a little a little bit of what the program, kind of how it changed your trajectory as a professional and a coach. Um, but I would love to kind of dive into some more about your experience within the certification program and sort of how that contributed as well to to the work you're doing today. Yeah, I think the biggest thing was um, community and networking. Prior to this, <clears throat> I, I really didn't know others that were professionals in the psychedelic field. I knew, you know, psychonauts or my friends or people that have experience, but not no one that was committed to working with psychedelics in a professional way. So, and I, I still talk to um, co- people from my cohort. They're some of my best friends. Like I, I've, I've been able to build community and, and through Paul too, <clears throat> I really um, was able to know that this is a space that is is professional, that people are 
are experts in this field. And this is not something that, you know, people just do for fun recreationally. So for me, it was realizing and meeting all sorts of people in the field that are doing great things in the field too. So I think the the, the community aspect was one of the best parts of the program because prior to that, I didn't really know people. So once mm-hmm. I was able to tap into that community and then collaborate with others too. So I've done retreats with some of my cohorts. Um, I've, I've gone to retreats uh, through the third wave that I met um, through an organization called uh, One Heart. And yeah. that kind of changed a lot for me too. So I feel like that was like the beginning uh, step to really being a, a professional in the psychedelic field. Yeah, you know, and it's 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 a little bit like um, even a lot of the work we're doing, like knowing you're not alone. Uh, knowing that, you know, there are people out there, especially, you know, because we're non-clinical, non-medical, right? And so there's this there's this incredible momentum and, you know, with maps and um, all the things that are happening on the legality side and, you know, people healing PTSD and sexual traumas and, you know, all this incredible work that's happening in the more white-walled clinical medical space. But then we know that, like, a massive percentage of the psychedelic use that's occurring is for people that are just trying to reduce a little social anxiety or be a little bit more productive at work or be a better husband or be a better father or mother. Um, and that's kind of where we come in. And so this feeling like, you know, you're not alone in that and that, and that there are ethical bounds and ethical communities and professional standards and, and ways of doing this, even though we are all, we are kind of in this wild West underground space um, yeah, maybe would you say it gave you confidence in the work you're doing and clarity and, um, and obviously that sense of community is like gasoline. For sure. I think confidence was, was the biggest thing because before CCP, I was supporting others, but not in a way where I had like foundational knowledge of what I was doing. So it was kind of by intuition. And I think having that confidence, having the knowledge, having the framework of, of how to support others with psychedelics that's what allowed me to tap into it and to be like, Hey, you know what? I, I do know what I'm doing. I do have a foundation. I do have the framework and that's when others started taking me more serious as well. So I think that to me was pivotal to, and it was, you know, in 2020, it's about three years ago. So a lot has changed in the psychedelic field, but I'm glad that I was able to get into it before. I mean, one of the part of the first cohort for this program. So that to me was like, I, I think I'm, I'm glad I got in when I got in early because then I, I've been able to see how it's changed, how it's transformed, how we speak about psychedelics is a lot different than how it was back then, three years ago even. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the last three years is more progress in the last three years than the last 30 years. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting times that we're in, um, just seeing where, where it's going and how it's going to continue to go. But also that we are re- re- um, responsible to be ethical. Like you said, that's a big thing. Um, there's a lot of, and I've, I've heard a lot of things in the psychedelic space where there are unethical facilitators or or, or um, practitioners that are not really in this for the right reasons. So that, and that can make the whole field, you know, can, can kind of tarnish it. So it's really up to us to be uh, stewards of this medicine in a way that is safe and, and practical for others to access. Yeah. I love that, Adrian. And, and let me ask you this and, you know, somewhat of a personal question, I guess, but safety you know there's this and of course there's physical safety and psychological safety and you know all the different types of safety but in what ways would you say like if you had never done a certification program in what ways are your clients safer now in your care like what did what learnings what what takeaways what guidance specifically that that we instruct in the certification program has made you a i would say a better i don't know if better is the right word a a a a more integrated or or more aware guide facilitator coach that has enhanced the safety of your client's experience i think one of the biggest things is knowing that this medicine is not for everyone that as much as people want to work with it there are certain um capabilities that someone should not be working with the medicine. I really didn't know about all of that before going to CCP one. So learning that set and setting is important, but also that really being careful when we, when you work with someone is, is also, are they a right fit for this type of work? And I think just because people are excited or because they want to, they want to work with you. It's also a relationship that us as coaches have to know, like, Hey, is this person the right person to be doing this type of work? Or even if it, is this even in my scope? If, if someone is coming at me with things that I know are outside of my scope, 
I, I, I can refer them to someone that I know that, hey, this is their specialty or they, they, they work specifically with these type of people and I'm not the best person to work with them. I, I don't think I knew that to, before to have a network of practitioners that have their all, all of their kind of expertise. And so if, if that's not me, then I, it, it's my duty to know, like, hey, you know what, this is not within my scope of work and I can refer you to someone else. Yeah, that's a huge, especially, you know, there's so much trauma in the world, right? And, um, you know, I think a lot of people, a lot of facilitators, they don't find out someone has trauma till they've already given them the mushrooms, right? And, um, mm-hmm. and that creates a very dangerous and scary situation for anybody, for both parties. And so, um, yeah, I love that. And, and, and Adrian, in your work, high dose experience work, do you work with ayahuasca or mushrooms or I, I didn't ask, do you specialize in a yeah. specific medicine now? Yeah, psilocybin. So I, I, I do my own personal healing with ayahuasca and I have a connection to that medicine the most, but when I hold space for others, it's with psilocybin. Okay, cool. And, and what would you say, you know, um, for someone listening from an experiential perspective and a, you know, I guess a coaching perspective, how would you describe the differences between those two medicines? Oh man. <laughs> uh, so in ways they are similar. Like I've had people and me myself where I've worked with you know, both of them and I, I've sometimes it's, I feel like I'm on ayahuasca when I'm, when I'm on mushrooms, but I would say ayahuasca is more of a purgative medicine and she's like a spiritual doctor. I say she, cause she has a motherly uh, energy spirit. So in, in that essence, like it, it can be, it's a lot more heavy on the body for folks. There is purging involved there. And that could mean um, different things on the ayahuasca is not just throwing up, but so I would say with ayahuasca, it, it's a lot more somatic and it could be a lot more intense for folks than, than, than psilocybin. And, and also with ayahuasca, as I have seen how people can, it could be a lot for folks and people can get really have an outwardly difficult experience. And for that medicine, I, I would say you definitely need to have a really close relationship with that medicine and, and even go and study in the Amazon of um, with indigenous people who have been working with the medicine for a long time. That's not something that I feel called to do which is why I'm not serving that. And, and not, not everyone does go that route, but I, I think it is, it is unsafe to do so, to work with that medicine, unless you have a really close relationship, not just with yourself, but holding space for others and working with it in that way. And with psilocybin, though you still have to have a relationship with the medicine, it's not as, for me, as, in, as intense or as intrusive as ayahuasca. Well, that's because you... <laughs> you remember your first ayahuasca. Now you take mushrooms five years later. You're like, Oh, this is nothing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're still, they're still very powerful and profound and wise teachers, mushrooms, but yeah. um, not like I was, you know, in the deep end with, with the grandmother. Right. Well, I think, you know, when I look at like the modern world, you know, I often think about, you know, what are, and this obviously comes from our certification program as well, is like, what's the right medicine? You mentioned it earlier. Like, what's the right medicine for this individual in the context they're presenting with the previous diagnoses or the medications or the, you know, tendencies that that I'm seeing before me? And like, I've alluded a few times, we live in this modern world. We're like on screens all the time. We don't have a lot of, or relatively, we have a relatively low amount of social engagement. We, we often don't spend enough time in nature. We, we, we don't often see the sunrise. We probably don't sleep that well. So there's all of these sort of ailments of modern life. And, and sometimes when I think about ayahuasca or mushrooms, it's like, wow, these are, call them ancient indigenous plants that were really utilized for very, very earthly problems in traditional societies, right? Very problems in people that were extremely connected to the planet, that were extremely connected to nature. And what is that when someone that is significantly disconnected from the planet, right? They're working 50 hours a week, et cetera. Like, what is that, you know, what does that like risk profile look like, right? How is that how is that mismatch? You know, I know it works a lot, but for people that it doesn't work with, that don't resonate, to what extent is that disconnection from the planet to blame for the for the for the earthliness or the power that they're just not accustomed to coming from such a a modernized existence? 
Yeah, and I think these medicines, have, like like you said, they've been here for thousands of years, used by indigenous ancestors, and I, I think now there's there's we're we're starting to go back to that because there is that disconnection between us, Mother Nature, spirit, all of that. So I, I think you know we're having this third wave of of psychedelics, which essentially plant medicine to help us come back to that, to help us come back to how we used to be because mm. things are not working out now. We have, you know, a lot of people that have mental health issues, anxiety, depression, loneliness, all of that is at an all-time high. It's really allowing us to come back to the ways that we, how we, we used to live, being more in nature, being more in community, being more connected, stepping away from the screens. I think that is what the medicine is here to kind of show us how to do and people are now waking up to that, to saying that, hey, these are not drugs. These are not, I mean, compared to like alcohol and other things that are legal, these are things that are really can have profound impact, profound healing, profound connection to self, to spirit, to community that I think people are now becoming more aware of that. But it's kind of silly because our indigenous ancestors knew this all along. This is, was a way of life for them. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we're in this time where people are coming back to that where we're starting to see that this is very much needed and this medicine is not going anywhere. The mycelial network has has grown and is growing to where it is. The, the underground movement is now going to start to make its way and hopefully soon enough it'll be more accessible for everyone out there. But some of us, like myself, I did not have the time or I didn't have the patience, or I, get, or I, I really couldn't wait for things to get better in the above ground world because I was really struggling and I really needed help at the time. And that was the only thing I knew to help. I didn't want to get an, an antidepressant. And for me, that was my rock bottom. So I'm, I'm glad that I, I did have the courage to step into the unknown. But now that those of us that have done that can pave the way for others as well. Yeah. And, and again, kind of shepherd, you know, you stepped into the unknown and then stepped into it again and then again. <laughs> and so this like, you know, this, this now you're able from that learning, you know, from all that, you know, experience, you can now help people shepherd, you can shepherd them through a, a, a and it, it, I don't want to use the word easier, but easier path into this work um, with very clear direction because, you know, nothing, nothing teaches you like, you know, um, challenge and adversity and even even making mistakes so yeah i think for me that was the biggest thing i realized because you know when i first started working with plant medicine it was not easy for me and it was very difficult like i said things got more difficult before they got easier but i think it was really to go deep with within my own healing process to go deep to learn how to work with the sacred medicine to learn mm -hmm. how their teachers how they can show us things and how to build a relationship with them so now I do have a strong connection with them. And when I speak to others, when I help them, when I, when I, when I, when I help guide them through this process, they, I, I can speak with confidence because I have been there. You, you, you can only take someone as far as you've gone with yourself. So I'm, I'm really glad that though it was difficult and, and really, you know, I, dark at some points, I'm glad I was able to go through that. I also know what that feels like. So when someone is going through that themselves, I can sit with them in the darkness as well because I've been through that in my own journey. There's nothing more valuable. I love that you can only take someone as far or as deep as you've gone yourself. And I think in coaching, there's it's especially, it's just so true, right? Um, and, and it's that sort of intuitive knowing, you know, that, that experience just powers our intuition and really kind of informs the work that we do. And um, that's why, you know, we've been talking a lot about different ways and different programs and things that we're doing here at the Psychedelic Coaching Institute. And it's it's so experiential, you know, increasingly when we think about how we're going to work with coaches in the future. It's like, well, how do we add more experiential, more, you know, more medicine, more more intensive, more more plant experiences and, and non-psychedelic experiences as well, just to like make sure that our coaches, apart from learning the you know, the, the, the textbook stuff, like how do we know that they're, they're truly fit to be guides, to truly fit to be coaches? And I think especially when, when, when working with psychedelics, it, it is hard to sit with someone if you haven't quite done the work with the medicine yourself. And I have met people that don't have a lot of experience with medicine and I wouldn't recommend them or sit with them because it, it really, it's just something that it, it's a learned experience and you learn 
by by doing it. it's not something like how you know someone that that's a therapist can work with people that have depression when not have been depressed themselves but working with plant medicine is different because it is something that you can't really explain to someone how the process of it is how the experience is it's like telling someone colors that can't see so it, it, that that does kind of worry me when some people are like, Hey, I, I, you know, I really want to work with psychedelics. I've sat with it once and I have got a calling to work with them. It's like, okay, well, how long have you been working with them? I'm not gatekeeping or anyway, but it's really just being wary of those that don't have quite the connection, the experience of working with the medicine in a way where they can best support others. And that's how, you know, people, it could be re-traumatizing to work with someone that is not fully equipped to, to, to work with the medicine in a way that, that would be better if, if they had more experience with it. John Krakauer wrote a book in 1996. In 1996, a bunch of people got killed on Mount Everest, and there was there was like a lot of reasons for that. But but he was talking about this one group. I think it was from South Africa, and they came to Mount Everest with this guide who had faked a bunch of his resume. <laughs> like, oh, wow. like imagine like you know you hire this guy to take you up mount everest and he's like never been to thirty thousand feet himself he's never you know all this stuff on his resume was was made up and not factual and when they got to base camp like someone was like fact check it or however that you did that in 96 you know i don't think you had like a smartphone on mount everest or anything like that but but yeah I, you know when you were telling me you know and you were sharing that story i'm like God, yeah it's like it's like if i'm going to climb mount everest i'm going to make sure my guide's been there not once or twice but like this is like his 50th time or her 50th time mm -hmm. being up there um i want to make sure that if a storm rolls in we run out of oxygen the rope breaks the you know the the snowsuit rips i don't know like you want to make sure someone's prepared for for absolutely anything, and there's no no substitute for um, for experience, no matter what. Yeah, someone posted the other day like, "I want my guide to have gone through hell and back in a psychedelic experience. If not, I don't want them." Yeah, you know what's funny is I was talking to a friend recently, and he said he he took 15 grams of mushrooms. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> "Like that's what I want from my guide. I want someone that's had 15 grams of mushrooms." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I haven't done that myself, but I'm also smart enough not to do that. <laughs> oh gosh, Adrian! Hey, this has been awesome, brother. Hey, what what didn't we tap into? You know, what else do you would you love to share with our audience here? Uh, maybe unique unique stuff you're working on. I know you're doing retreats, you're doing coaching, integration support. Um, how can we tie this up in the next couple of minutes? Yeah, I think one of the new projects that I'm working on that I'm currently uh, in week five of, I, I started a, a group microdose program. And that has been something that I've been wanting to do for a while. But uh, like microdosing is a very personal experience. And I, I was starting to work with clients and see like community is medicine. So I, I, I uh, started this program to have a, a community of folks that are microdosing together and are integrating together and having the tools and really just having community. And I think that's been the biggest thing that I, or I've, I've been most excited about is in, in this program. And I wanna, I'm gonna keep doing it because I really can see the benefit of having the structure, the framework, and really being intentional with microdosing. I think in the beginning of my practice, I started uh, supporting others with microdosing, but not really having the intentional support behind it, the framework and you know the proper protocols and all of that. So in the beginning, I think folks would microdose and often kind of stop because they wouldn't really see a big change in the beginning. And I would tell them like, hey, microdosing is a process. It's a, it, it could be kind of boring compared to macrodosing, but it, it's really having that framework that can set someone up for success. And I've seen, you know, big shifts with people that have been working with microdosing. And that's like kind of where a lot of my uh, energy is, is because I, I do believe microdosing is is you know the, the well it's already happening now but the future of psychedelics but really for me it's like putting that community aspect into it as well of having a, a container where folks can go through this together and that's kind of what really is exciting for me right now yeah that's know. neat so is that like you meet on zoom regularly or yeah, how does, yeah. What does that look we have like? weekly calls on zoom okay. and you know everyone has different protocols that they're on and different experiences and can all relate to each other. And also like I, the biggest thing for me too, is I really tell people, uh, teach them to 
learn the language of the mushrooms to learn how to commu- how, how they communicate with us, but how we can communicate with them and how that can show up with microdosing. And also let them know that with microdosing, it's not only about having the desired effects that people have, you know, the creativity, the flow states, it could also bring up emotions, bring up feelings that might need to be processed first. And sometimes those feelings or emotions can or may not be desired effects. So I, I do really uh, emphasize that in folks. And, you know, in, in the beginning, I, I did tell them that. And then as it was happening to them, like, hey, I feel really angry when I microdose. And it, it was good because then we can all see, we can all support them in that. Like, okay, well, mm-hmm. what is the medicine trying to teach you? What is it trying to help you see that you may not be able to see? And they were able to work with that anger. And that was a an opportunity to to work with emotions that they could have before been not wanting to work with. So I think the, like the, for, so for me, it's also telling people of learning how to build a relationship, learning how to communicate and how they communicate with us. Yeah. I love that. And you know, those types of reports are always interesting when you hear, I'm, I'm in a bad mood on mushrooms. I get tired on microdoses, you know, all of these sort of common things. And it's like, oh, wow, you know, well, the, I don't think the mushrooms are telling you to take a nap. I think they're saying that there's something that's that's tired of trying to come through <laughs> or like, yeah, or, you know, we got to let that anger out or whatever it is. And sometimes it is that actually, like there, there are people that's a kind of common effect that people feel is yeah. like, hey, I'm feeling tired when I microdose. But then I ask them like, okay, like they're like, you know, I want to be creative but I just, when I do it, I'm feeling tired and I ask them like, how's your rest? How's your sleep? Uh, well, I'm not sleeping much. I'm sleeping like five hours, hooked on coffee. It's like, well, before you need to tap in, be, be, before you have to tap into your creativity, the mushroom, like your body needs rest. So the mushrooms can amplify the need for that. And we can't bypass that. It's not going to just make us be more creative or uh, allow us to you know, be more productive if our body is required, it needs rest. So it's, it's going to uh, kind of scream a little bit louder and it's up to us to make the, to integrate that whatever it's it's, it's trying to show us. Yeah. Love that, Adrian. Well, Hey brother, where could people find you? Uh, My website is lozanoflows.com, L-O-Z-A-N-O flows. And then uh, my Instagram is lozano.flows. Love it, man. And your website's beautiful. I was on it a week or so ago. Oh, thank Um, you. Did a, a really nice job. I almost signed up. (laughs) <laughs> cool <laughs> well I'll, I'll see you there then <laughs> uh, all right brother wonderful speaking thank you so much for for carving out the time here for the second time and yeah. um it's always it's just been a pleasure man and so I'll, I'll talk to you soon adrian all right thank you very much thanks for having me on thank you so much for watching if you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics subscribe to this channel and visit the third wave.co where you'll find plenty of free resources on the intentional and responsible use of psychedelic medicines.